This is Audible. The Mind Illuminated A Complete Meditation Guide Integrating Buddhist Wisdom and Brain Science By Chula Dasa, John Yates, Ph.D., and Matthew Immergut, Ph.D. With Jeremy Graves Narrated by Sean Renette Forward So, how does a neuroscientist end up as a meditation master? The two disciplines are different, to be sure. My training in brain science deals with neurons and synapses, while my study of meditation is concerned with matters of attention, introspective awareness, and investigating the nature of subjective experience. But in many ways I've found that the two modes of understanding the world are more complementary than one might think, and they've given me a unique insight into how mindfulness actually changes the brain and our perceptions of the world around us. I've always been a seeker. For as long as I can remember, I've been fascinated by both the mind and the physical sciences. I always felt there must be a way to make sense of and unify our understanding of the world. What I sought, and what eventually crystallized into a lifelong passion, was nothing less than a search for ultimate truth. Little did I know what a long and convoluted but ultimately rewarding journey I would take to find it. I spent my teen years reading philosophy and psychology, Kant, Husserl, James, and Jung in particular. Despite the many insights they offered, it was disappointing to discover how little we knew about the mind, especially as compared to the precision and rapidly increasing depth of our knowledge of the physical world. So I then turned to religion, Christianity specifically, in the hope of finding answers. Inspired by the writings of John of the Cross, Teresa of Avila, Meister Eckhart, and the anonymous author of The Cloud of Unknowing, I thought this might offer a path to my goal. After about three years of dedicated study and practice, I became a seminarian and was soon immersed in church history, philosophy, theology, and interpretive doctrines. But after another year and a half, I left, disillusioned at how unrepresentative the great mystics were of the modern church. Another dead end. However, I was not deterred in my search for truth. Since this happened during the mid-sixties, I followed in the footsteps of a whole generation of seekers and turned to mind-altering chemicals and plant medicines for further exploration. Through my experiences with these, I gained, for the first time, some sense of what the early Christian mystics had spoken about. The search for truth seemed almost within my grasp. However, entheogens, as they are sometimes called, have their limitations. Mostly, I realized just how fluid our perceptions are and how much they depend upon neurochemical events in the brain, much more than on the data provided via our sense organs. Shortly after realizing this, I was introduced to Eastern religions with their promise of exactly the kind of truth I sought. Unfortunately, I couldn't afford to go to Asia like Ram Dass and others who had discovered both the virtues and limitations of mind-altering substances. But then the Beatles introduced Maharishi Mahesh Yogi and Transcendental Meditation to the West. This marked the true beginning of my meditation career. Not all of my exploration has been in the spiritual world. I've always had an interest in the so-called hard sciences, first sparked by my father, who was himself a research scientist with interests in everything from geology to astrophysics. By this time, I was a graduate student in physiology, the study of the mechanisms of the human body, and the idea of exploring the mind introspectively while at the same time studying its relationship to the brain was fascinating. These parallel explorations were to become my life's work. I spent two years practicing transcendental meditation, during which time I also completed my master's degree and began working on my Ph.D. When I discovered Buddhist meditation, the many pieces of my life so far began to fall perfectly into place. I'd come into possession of a sitar in need of repair, and I wanted to learn to play it. 
By chance I met someone who could help me do both, and who had also spent several years studying Buddhism and meditating in Burma and Thailand. He was to become my first real spiritual teacher. Upasika Kema Ananda had returned from Southeast Asia to teach others what he had learned, and had created a small residential community of students. Over the course of several weeks of sitar repair, as we carefully fit pieces together and waited for glue to dry, he gradually introduced me to the Buddha Dharma. He also encouraged me to attend one of the frequent weekend meditation retreats he offered. Everything he'd taught me so far sounded very appealing, but what clinched it was the day he told me the Buddha had said, Don't take my word for anything I teach. Don't accept it on my authority. Come and see for yourself. Kema explained that everything the Buddha taught was available to anyone willing to take the time and train the mind to discover it for themselves. This sounded like science to me. I immediately asked to attend the next weekend retreat. I was soon part of a strong community of dedicated meditation practitioners with ready access to excellent teachers. This particular group represented a unique confluence of Tibetan and Theravadan teachings in the person of Namgyal Rinpoche, also known as George Dawson. Originally ordained as Ananda Bodhi, he was an acknowledged master in the Southeast Asian tradition before being recognized as the reincarnation of Namgyal by the 16th Gyalwa Karmapa, Rangjung Rigpe Dorje. My own teachers, Upasika Kema Ananda and Jodhidama Bhikkhu, were his students. As Kema's student in this mixed lineage, I simultaneously engaged in the Tibetan Kagyu Foundation practices, Nundro, and the Theravadan Mahasi-style noting meditation practice. Meanwhile, I completed my Ph.D. thesis, and my interests turned more and more to neurophysiology and cognitive psychology. It was the beginning of a hugely exciting era that continues to the present day, in which the neural circuitry of the brain is being mapped out in detail and correlated with various mind states, mental activities, and functions. However, throughout my postdoctoral fellowship years, I experienced a growing conflict between the kinds of animal experimentation required by laboratory research and the moral precepts that urged me to refrain from causing harm and suffering. In the end, I took the Upasaka vows of a dedicated lay practitioner, a sort of layman's version of monastic commitment, and ceased to be active in laboratory research. Instead, I dedicated myself to teaching neuroscience and studying the research of others, while at the same time engaging intensely in meditation and studying ancient wisdom texts from many traditions. The best description of the intervening years is to say they have been dedicated to studying the brain from the inside through meditation, and the mind from the outside through neuroscience and cognitive psychology. The confluence of meditation and neuroscience is a fascinating one, with the potential for each to greatly enhance the other. Both are, in fact, sciences, although meditation falls in the category of first-person science, which is only gradually gaining legitimacy among traditional scientists. In the science of meditation, the mind itself is the laboratory and the various meditation practices and techniques constitute the experimental apparatuses that are utilized in this research. It is a science in the sense that it is objectively verifiable through repeated testing and replication of results. Everyone who accurately performs the same experiment in meditation reports the same results. And as with the physical sciences, meditation also generates technologies for change, profound changes in perception, worldview, mental states, and behavior. Through meditation we begin to see and understand the fine structure and workings of the mind. The descriptions of the mind produced by meditators can then point out to a neuroscientist where and how best to apply various methods and technologies in their investigation of the brain. Likewise, the information about the brain revealed through science can guide us in our meditation practices, making them not only more effective, 
but also giving us new perspectives on what we experience in practice. One great example of this is the distinction I make in this book between attention and awareness. Despite hundreds of thousands of meditators practicing over millennia, it has never before been clearly conceptualized and articulated that the ordinary mind has two distinct ways of knowing, even though these different ways of knowing have so much to do with achieving the goals of meditation. However, Cognitive psychology and neuroscience have recently shown that there are two distinctly different kinds of knowing that involve completely different parts of the brain. This is a finding that deeply informs new ways of practicing meditation and interpreting our meditation experiences from beginner to adept. This is only one example, but the point should be obvious. Meditation can guide and inform neuroscience, and neuroscience can do the same for meditation. A very clear pattern has emerged from our scientific explorations of the brain. Over and over again we find there are neural correlates for mental activities. Although some will resist this statement, I believe we will eventually find that all mental phenomena, without exception, have their neural correlates. This has led many scientists to become staunch materialists, insisting that the mind is merely what matter does when organized to an appropriate degree of complexity. I am not one of them. Historically, the prevailing view in cultures throughout the world has been dualism, the idea that matter is one thing and the mind another. However, close examination renders this view untenable. As a result, two reductionist interpretations have always existed side by side with the dualistic view, each eliminating one side or the other of this dualism. Materialistic reductionism asserts there is only matter, and the mind is at best an emergent property of highly organized matter, and modern neuroscience is believed by many to support this view. On the other hand, meditation and other spiritual practices often make it clear that our subjectively experienced reality is mind-created, exactly the realization I had in my teens, although I arrived at it from a different route. This realization often draws people to some form of idealism, the other reductionist interpretation, which asserts there is only mind and that matter is an illusion, a mere projection of the mind to account for experience. For them, science is irrelevant to any search for ultimate truth. Obviously, I'm not one of those, either. I am a non-dualist. Primarily as a result of meditation experiences, but supported by rational analysis as well, I hold strongly to this fourth alternative view. There is only one kind of stuff, and both mind and matter are mere appearances. When looked at from the outside, this stuff appears as matter, and as such has been the subject of scientific investigation, but when examined from the inside, this exact same stuff appears as mind. Non-duality, as realized through direct experience in meditation, completely resolves this dilemma. Both the implications and explanatory power of non-dualism are vast and would require at least another book to even scratch the surface. But thus, I say that I have spent my life investigating the mind from the outside through neuroscience and the brain from the inside through meditation. The core of my career as a dedicated lay practitioner has been a combination of daily study, practice, and numerous meditation retreats. This has been interspersed with several marriages, children, career moves, and all the ordinary distractions of a layman's life. The latter were as helpful as much as they were distractions, giving me plenty of opportunity to apply what I had learned by working through my own conditioning under challenging circumstances. I am especially blessed to have been present for this great intersection of the various Buddhist practice traditions, once so isolated from each other, as they have come together in the great melting pot of a developing global culture. I am equally blessed to have witnessed the tremendous advances in technology and research that are revealing the nature of physical reality, which includes unlocking the mysteries of the human brain. In particular, 
I feel deep appreciation and gratitude for the opportunity to bear witness to and participate in a process in which the cumulative wisdom of these Buddhist traditions rubs shoulders with Western scientific inquiry. This has all been part of my own personal journey, from despair to joy and from ignorance to wisdom, for which I am incredibly grateful.